avionics in the Falcon and Dragon rockets. And now he's working for uh, Relativity Space with the unusual goal of trying to 3D print a whole rocket. This is an amazing feat of engineering. And with that in mind, would you please join me in welcoming to the Hackaday Supercon stage, Bryce Salmi. Hey, always a little short there. Um, cool. So uh, I'm Bryce Salmi, and uh, I'm an avionics hardware engineer. I can take this off, right? Uh, I'm an avionics hardware engineer at Relativity Space, and we're uh, local here in uh, Inglewood, California, so right next to LAX. And uh, as noted, we are attempting to 3D print a rocket. And um, my goal today is to show you that this is not without challenge, but it's an amazing challenge. And, and to do that, you have to bring an amazing world-class uh, group of people together to actually uh, build all the pieces necessary to, to print a rocket. Uh, this also brings um, uh, a confluence of uh, forces, like in rocketry, that I hope to convey that will help um, that help drive the, the reality that um, 3D printing is uh, basically uh, well-suited for rocketry, uh, where it may not be well-suited for other forms of, of manufacturing. Um, and rocketry is, is unique in that, that aspect. So before I, I present uh, and, and go through what, you know, what we're doing, uh, I want to show a quick video that kind of gets us all on the same page, lets you know what we're trying to do, how we think, um, and uh, just some of the technology that we're doing. So um, enjoy. Hopefully now we're on the same page. So what we're doing is literally trying to attempt to 3D print a rocket. Now there's many different components to that. Some of them are large and structural. Some of them are, are small, like an, an, an engine. And uh, as you saw in that video, there are several technologies necessary to do this. And uh, we'll kind of start at the beginning. So we were formed in 2015 by Tim Ellis and Jordan Noon. Um, both of them. Uh, worked in the space uh, industry, Tim Ellis at Blue Origin and Jordan Noon at, uh, at SpaceX. Um, and both, I believe, were in the USC Rocket Propulsion Group. If any of you were at USC Rocket Propulsion Group, kind of alumni there. Uh, and really, what we're doing is we're taking a new approach to manufacturing rockets. And um, by you actually utilizing uh, a different form of manufacturing from the start, from a clean slate, lets us think differently, let's just approach problems and reduce the overall work necessary to get there. Most people think that 3D printing, oh, we reduce labor. Well, rockets are largely labor. They're a huge component of labor uh, necessary to do that. Uh, but there's also a huge cognitive overhead. Every engineer needs to make sure that each piece comes together like at their interface, uh, through manufacturing and testing, and uh, needs to put a, a quite a substantial effort into, into making sure that's going to work. If any of you, and I know a few of you here are in the space industry, uh, have went, gone through an acceptance test or a qualification campaign, it's insane. 
and uh, takes a lot of time. So the reducing the number of parts can drastically reduce the number of people and number of, of, of just effort you need to put into each individual part uh, to, to, to build up a rocket. Uh, we also reduce fixed tooling. So one of the kind of background things about rocketry is uh, if you have a certain diameter tank, you have to build uh, welding machines and uh, jigs and molds and transport uh, materials, all these fixed tooling costs that can be tens or millions of dollars. Um, and that's just locked up into that design, which as you iterate on a design, like does not, it's not conducive to changing that design. You want, you maybe might make your rocket a lot longer instead of wider, things like that. Uh, because you can't actually uh, quickly iterate on that tooling. So by focusing on these and actually using the 3D printing process, we can reduce a lot of that overhead that people have to think about, people have to design. It might not allow us to go ahead with a more manufacturable or a more higher performance vehicle. So uh, with that said, we're actually moving into the constellation market because uh, that, that market is, is, uh, is taken off, I guess, pun intended. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and there's about to be a huge uh, uh, demand for dedicated launch services to specific orbits. You can ride share, but if you ride share with the larger rocket, you have to either wait for that rocket, or a rocket that's gonna launch to go into your, the orbit that you want, or you have to pay for the whole rocket. So that brings up Terran-1. So Terran-1 is our 3D printed rocket, and it's aimed at uh, launching about 1,250 kilograms to orbit, uh, so low Earth orbit. Uh, so roughly the size of a mini, in the all fun of launching cars into space, uh, it's about a mini. I think it's a mini. So uh, this rocket ends up being about 100 feet tall. Uh, sorry, yeah, 100 feet tall and seven feet in diameter, which might strike you as that's a huge printer, right? Um, we'll get into that. So, uh, and then uh, in all things uh, fun rocketry, this is a methylox engine, so a methylox rocket, so uh, oxygen and methane. Uh, so. You, we, we are printing this vehicle to, uh, to, uh, to use both cryogenic um, uh, fuels. And uh, those cryogenic fuels are autogenously pressurized. Does anyone here know what that, that is? It's, yeah, it reduces, so um, as you can also probably guess, if you need COPVs or pressure tanks inside for things like helium or nitrogen or anything that you might want to pressurize the tank, um, that's an extra system, that's, that's a whole other effort. So by autogenously pressurizing, we are taking part of the fuel that was liquid, it has now been heated and turned into a gas, and throwing that back into the same tank to help pressurize, it reduces the whole system. Um, so uh, the engines themselves are, using, are printed using traditional manufacturing, uh, not traditional, that additive manufacturing that is commercial, DMLS printing. Some of you, who here has used direct metal laser sintering? All right, that's a good, good crowd, it's some, someone said it. It's, it's catching on. It, but it is essentially layering down pieces of uh, powdered metal and then using lasers to center each layer. Uh, so uh, the Aeon engine can be printed that way. It, is, it can fit within those, those constraints. Um, but the, the, uh, the Terra-1 rocket cannot. That needs a custom printer. No one makes that. And that's why we've built Stargate, which focuses on actually printing a vehicle that is 100 feet tall and seven feet wide. No one makes this. So we actually have that in Inglewood, California. And uh, with both of these technologies combined, we are trying to go from a new design to, uh, to flight in 60 days, which uh, is a pretty monumental effort. And all the pieces need to come together to make that happen. So for AM1, this is the engine you saw in the beginning video uh, firing. We've actually fired it 104 times in five iterations of it in just over a year, which um, building a rocket engine is not simple and it takes time. So tra uh, traditionally, it usually takes about a year to get a whole campaign going uh, for a particular design. We've done that five times in the course of a year and that is using 3D printing. It is designed from the start to be 3D printed. You really can't make it without uh, DMLS printing. So by doing that, it allows us to think about it from a clean slate. And when we do that, uh, we've come up with creative ways to remove the structural supports that you need when printing to support overhangs and things like that we can be, um, we've, we've developed that technology because we started early in doing it uh, to allow us to, uh, to remove those features that can be a pain when using this technology. Uh, and when you, uh, 
when you look at this engine, this is the pressure fed configuration. So uh, in flight, there is a, a, a turbo pump, um, but this is three components. We hit print three times. Uh, and that consists of the nozzle, the combustion chamber, the injector, and the igniter. Uh, and the, the best that I can find uh, on the Apollo engines, uh, you know, back in the space race in the 60s, just those parts consisted of about 5,600 different little pieces that had to come together. So when you think of how many engineers do you need to design those, how many manufacturing personnel do you need to, to put that through a system and make sure that you are producing a vehicle that you can rely on to get people into space. Um, that's really hard. That takes a lot of people. If it's three parts, that's a lot more manageable. So uh, that's, that's really where when you sit back and think about what the power of 3D printing does is it allows you to, to have more complex parts uh, because there's fewer of them. You can, you can uh, optimize and solve different problems you never had the chance prior to solve. So, yeah. If you've never seen uh, DMOS printing on, on the right, uh, you saw a little, bit, a little bit of it in the beginning video, uh, but we, we essentially layer a, a, a powder bed down with, uh, with powdered metal and we'll build the part up piece by piece, layer by layer. And then when you're done, you, you remove all the sand. So the one design constraint is you, gotta, you do have to make sure that you can remove the sand. But um, this allows us to do things like print cooling fins inside you know, the jacket of the engine and allow us to um, do things you would never be able to, to manufacture or put a more of them in uh, that you would never be able to, to fit in with uh, subtractive manufacturing, you know, putting it on a CNC machine or some type of mill. Uh, There's also a picture of a uh, piece of turbo, turbo pump uh, assemblies that we are printing at the moment uh, for the engine. So like I've gone over, uh, we, can reduce the we can increase the complexity of each part and reduce the overall complexity of the vehicle. It's kind of like you know, seeing the forest for the trees, right? How do I make this an easier problem to solve? How can I iterate faster? Because if I iterate faster, I'm learning faster and I'm coming to something that works. So. Um, yeah, that's used kind of all around the vehicle on things that are kind of small, right? The on engine, valves, manifolds, structural brackets, things that make sense to print. Um, you, may, you know, maybe some valves you might want to print custom, some you might want to buy, but uh, oftentimes you're, you're sitting there thinking, you know, where does this technology allow me to optimize? And since we're printing uh, engines uh, so early, because we, we are, um, that was one of the huge items that we, we worked on first, uh, we have a test site in Stennis. And we are firing this engine. Uh, I mean, we're ramping up for another, another test campaign at the moment, and it's been fun to see our new test stand uh, take shape. Uh, this is our, our, our test stand we've, that you saw in the video. Uh, this one's, uh, if you follow us on social media, uh, this one is, is being built at the moment. There's my coworker, John, putting, uh, putting uh, sensors and uh, tubing on the, on the engine, and then as we saw in the video, we, we fire it. Uh, and that's always exciting. Um, I actually can't wait to go down and see one of the tests in person. Uh, so just to give you a sense of what, that, what that's like when, when you're testing engines, if you've never worked on rocketry but might be interested, uh, this is what it's like. So, by doing a lot of tests quick, you learn fast. So like I said, we've done five iterations of this engine in just about a year. And uh, in each iteration, you're trying to fix things you saw, you've seen, trying to optimize for things you didn't expect. Um, and if that takes a few months as opposed to a year, um, you make progress fast. Um, and while this is happening, and because we're using DMOS printing on, on that, we can, we can leverage the commercial market for, for those printers. Uh, there's the fact that no one builds a printer big enough to print a rocket. And that's where Stargate comes in. So Stargate is a custom 3D printer, and uh, it's located here in, in, well, not here, but just down the street in Inglewood, California. And uh, for scale, here is Tim. Uh, it's a large printer, and it prints tanks, and it prints vehicle structures. Um, right now, I mean, it, I've, every day I see a new print, and it is, it is quite amazing to see the progress go because you can iterate quick. You get an answer to a question uh, much faster than if you have to send it to a factory or build the tooling necessary to, to do it. Um, and because we did, uh, we did use uh, robotic arms, 
uh, they can be collaborative. So one can be printing while the other is machining or inspecting. Um, one, two can be printing. Uh, it is scalable. So um, a lot of effort has gone into figuring out how do you build a vehicle and a launch and, and maintain a launch cadence and an iteration design cadence necessary to support that 60-day iteration cycle. And if any of you are wondering, it is in fact named after St StarCraft, right? Stargates in Protoss, right? If, who here has played StarCraft? Yeah, nice. Okay, so uh, what is what is the, what does the Stargate do in the game? Warps in air units. It's kind of fitting, right? So um, we're warping in in rockets. So kind of fun. There's a there's a few other projects at Relativity kind of taking names after uh, StarCraft stuff, but um, it's kind of fun. So there is one of the tanks. Now this tank's about a year old, so we've actually made a lot of progress in that time. Um, but it's this is the, a photo that I can show you, um, and that is 3D printed. That you know, they, like that was built right layer by layer up as as a, a rocket tank. So uh, you can see the size of an engine right below it, um, and uh, kind of hard to see, but you can see person right behind. So uh, these are no small feats, right? Th this this is a tough problem, and it is a combination of material science uh, welding skills and science and engineering, um, uh, software, uh, just robot, right, robotics problems, you know, to no end. Like you, you have this culmination of all these skill sets coming together to be able to print something that large over that much uh, of a printing surface. And that's, the reason that this all works is because it's at a crossroad, like rocket cheese are crossroads, where you have a relatively low volume. So, even if you're flying 200 rockets a year, right, the, the automobile industry would kind of laugh, like we build that in an hour, right? Something, right, like it's high volume in rocketry is, is in other industries low volume. So you also have a high unit cost. So most rockets are several million dollars. We are aiming at a $10 million vehicle. SpaceX publicly is a $60 million vehicle, last time I checked. And uh, so you have the ability to put this extra effort into, to, manufacture in a different way. Um, and when, when you also add in tooling, there's a whole capital cost that we are removing. It allows us to focus on building the printer, building a new vehicle, and iterating fast. Uh, so since we're not held down by just having to uh, make a huge decision uh, about putting uh, all this, this, this effort into just something that you know, welds that size tank. Um, yeah. Uh, the, the ripple effect, uh, if for any of you that's worked in the aerospace industry, uh, of a change can be like really painful. And if you've if you've ever had like some problem come up on a vehicle where um, you know schedule is always is always hard, uh, you end up having this ripple effect where if if one person's problem, uh, say in the tank, can be solved, say with avionics, you'll end up saying I can I can iterate avionics faster, so let's fix it in avionics um, by being able to print a tank in a week, essentially, uh, you can actually honestly trade just printing the tank better, right? Don't let it ripple down into the other teams and let them focus on what they do best. And on that note, this is a really rough estima estima uh, like estimation of, of a rocket design. And um, don't take it with a grain of salt, but it is roughly what I've seen. And the blue line is kind of development from a, a new vehicle, right? It takes about two years to really get a, a company spooled up and building, like figuring out what they want to build for engines and tanks and structures of a vehicle. And then once you know what you want to build, it takes about a year to build all the tooling and, and get that process moving forward. Now the green line is avionics, electronics, software. Software, well, software is really fast, but let's talk hardware. We're all hardware you know, enthusiasts here. Most of us are hardware enthusiasts, so um, at a hardware convention. So it still takes about one year. If you have a new design that you're trying to put a few, like drive valves on a, on a rocket in a new way or interface new sensors, um, you're generally looking at about a year effort. Uh, if you're updating an old design or, um, or kind of optimizing, it can be less, but it's still a pretty monumental effort. And then when you actually go to build this hardware for flight and test it and qualify it, it still takes two to three months, easy, to do that. And then you see where we're going. So we are trying to build and fly a vehicle in 60 days. Just gonna let that pass. And our development cycle is on the order of about six months. 
So we are already substantially faster than even electronics iterates at most other companies building rockets. And that, uh, that brings me to avionics. So I'm an avionics hardware design engineer. And so my job has generally been to uh, solve problems that you know, interface with the vehicle, close the loop, right, sense something, actuate something, you know, help build computers, things like that. I've rarely seen a design get completely changed in two to three months because there's this huge qualification campaign. You have to be sure that when that lifts off, you can trust it. it, it even if it's only working for 10 minutes, it's anyone here has launched a rocket or worked on something in space, that 10 minutes can be terrifying and you need to know that it's going to work. So there's a huge effort to get that, um, to get, get that qualified. Um, and let alone your, your, even if everything was built and nothing changed, or everything was done, nothing changed, just to get something accepted to go on a vehicle roughly takes about three weeks. You can do, do a fast board spin in like you know, a week or two, right? Just thermal cycling alone in most test campaigns I've seen can take several days, just the thermal cycle part of it. So you have a minimum of three weeks that is almost half of the time it takes for us to iterate a whole vehicle. So do you see the problem coming in, right? We are now looking at a process that is really slow. Um, and that's why one of the huge challenges that I'm really excited about um, relativity uh, solving and helping solve that is how do we augment 3D printing? How do we build an avionics system that uh, prepares for change and reduces the amount of, of design uh, ripple that comes in with changes and allows us to move quick? Um, you know, and really augment that 3D process because it would be a shame if your, your mechanical structures became so fast that your electrical systems, your harnessing, uh, starts slowing you down. Um, even harnessing is probably one of the hardest things in rocketry to do. It's usually one of the, some of the most uh, 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 likely to fail in, in orbit. Um, you know, when you're going into a high vibration uh, situation, though each connection has the potential to back out or the crimp can fail, uh, wires can be cut, things like that. And uh, when you have tens of thousands of connections in the vehicle, that is quickly becomes one of the areas in a rocket that uh, avionics just, you know, you worry about it. And when you build a custom harness, um, I've often seen that take eight weeks. You know, so the vehicle now iterates faster than even the harnessing. Um, so the the, the reality of, of, of coming into relativity has been that like, we have to think differently, have to think about it uh, in a way that is proactive and anticipates the vehicle changing, which has forced us to th just think about things in a completely different manner. How does manufacturing uh, ideology change when you have 3D printing uh, affecting everything, not just you know, testing or jigs. It's literally making the whole vehicle move quicker uh, through the design cycle. And even though we're really not 3D printing circuit boards, um, th it affects us and we have to think about it. So uh, yeah, that's, that's, the, that's kind of the, the crutch there on the avionics. I, wi I wish I could show more, but it quickly comes down to ITAR and, and things like that where um, we'll figure out some way to, to get more info on that. But um, if you're local to LA, you probably know Inglewood, but this is our office in Inglewood. We actually have about four times as, this much, as much space as shown in here uh, in our little office park. One of them has the world's largest 3D printer um, in it, which is kind of cool. Uh, you would never know driving by. And uh, with that, uh, I will make my pitch, which is we are hiring. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, Hackaday, the Hackaday crowd is, is kind of an amazing confluence of people who are creative and people who are really technically inclined and this whole mix in between. And when you're looking at a problem that's never been solved before, you really want creative people. You want people thinking outside the box and, th and thinking not just, not, not against how it's been done before, but not assuming that's the only way to do it, right? Uh, maybe technology has changed. Maybe something has changed that allows me to do something different. And um, I've really seen that uh, be prevalent in, in very creative people. So um, this crowd to me is, is, you know, if you see something up here that you like and you think you want to do, by all means, you know, give us, give us, a, give us a ring, right? So um, these aren't all the positions. They're just some of them. And uh, I really invite you to, to, I guess, scan it. Let me know if it works. I 
I tried it on my computer screen, it worked, but uh, yeah, just go check them out. There's, there's a heck of a lot more. And if you're in college, we do have many open co-op and internship positions for the next uh, summer, 2019. So uh, if you want to get your uh, kind of foot in the space race door, you know, essentially, um, it's, it's moving fast. And I, it's, it's, been a, it's been a blast to be able to work on, on, on this technology that no one really knows will work. And I, I personally think it's going to. Uh, and with the quality of the engineering team uh, and just the team in general at Relativity, uh, it, every day that I go in uh, to work, it gives me that confidence that, it's, that we're going to figure it out. Um, and then I want to end on just a nice big picture of what I believe is the world's largest metal 3D printer. Uh, so this, this is here in, uh, just on the street in Inglewood. And um, for reference, I think I come up to about here on it. So roughly, I'm also kind of short, so. But uh, it's, it's big, it's huge. And um, it's, it's a huge robotics problem, software problem, materials problem. And uh, the fact that we are printing tanks like you saw in the beginning uh, with this uh, is a monumental effort. And uh, it's, we're ramping up to try to get, get one into flight. And it, it's just exciting to see how by taking, a, uh, taking the 3D te te printing technology and utilizing it from the start allows us to uh, move quicker and actually have to solve fewer problems or solve the problems we really need to solve, not just because they're problems we think we have to. Um, we can kind of sidestep them. So uh, I guess I'm a little early. I, I moved to that a bit quick, but um, yeah, I'm happy to, to take questions, I guess. Uh, at the, I think there's a, th there's a um, uh, question and answer thing after this, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, I'll end on that. So thank you.